Hi, I'm Michael Correa, and this is Psych Exam Review. In the previous video, I mentioned that children seem to naturally acquire the language that they're exposed to. So in this video, I want to go into a little more detail on this process of language development. Now, one thing that happens is children acquire vocabulary, and they acquire vocabulary very, very rapidly. Right? So within their first few years, children are able to learn thousands of words. Now, this brings up some questions about the conditioning approach, right? If we, if we try to explain this using behaviorism, we see that it's far too rapid for each individual word to be reinforced or punished, right? So it's, it just simply couldn't be the case that, that mom and dad sit down and, and reinforce every single correct word that the child uses, right? This would be too slow. So instead, it seems that we are prepared to learn words very quickly without reinforcement. And one way that this occurs is what's called fast mapping. And so fast mapping refers to the idea that young children are able to connect the sounds of a particular word with the meaning of that word after just a single exposure. So we have you know, this arbitrary pattern of sounds that make up the word, and that gets connected to the meaning of the word. And this can happen just from hearing the word once. So, you know, the child sees something and, and asks, you know, what's that? And mom says, you know, that's a doggy. And now the child knows the word doggy. And a week later, the child sees a doggy and points to it and says, doggy. Right? It's like they've connected those sounds with the meaning uh, immediately after this single exposure. So this is part of the explanation of how we're able to acquire so many words so quickly. Now, when children first start speaking, they speak in just single words, but eventually they start stringing words together, and they start with two-word sentences. And this is called telegraphic speech. And the reason that it's called telegraphic speech is that it's like a telegraph, in that it's only the most important words for communicating meaning. Children leave out all of the extra words, the function words. So even though they're constantly hearing words like the, a, uh, and they somehow have learned that these words don't really matter. You know, these sounds are just like grammatical fluff that, you know, allow us a little bit more precision, but that when you want to communicate meaning, you don't necessarily need those, right? And so if you want a cookie, you don't need to say, I want a cookie. You can just say, want cookie, and the meaning is clear. So the idea is that this telegraphic speech focuses on the content words, the words that have meaning, And the children tend to ignore function words, right? Words that serve grammatical purposes. Now, this actually indicates that by ignoring those words, they actually understand that those words are just serving grammatical purposes. They, they know that those words aren't the ones that have meaning. The ones that have meaning are the, the nouns and the verbs. And so those are the ones you should worry about speaking first. And, you know, I'll, I'll get to figuring out where to put of in a sentence later on. Now, another thing that happens with this telegraphic speech is that it starts following the syntactical rules of the language that the child is learning. So, for instance, when the child says big doggy, right, they see a, a, a large dog and they say big doggy, they're already showing that they kind of understand how grammar works in English and that you tend to put an adjective before a noun. Now, nobody's given them explicit instruction in this. You know, the child's two or three years old at this point, and so nobody's sitting down and saying, make sure that you always put your adjective before your noun. Uh, I mean, the child doesn't even know what an adjective is. But they're able to apply these rules, and it shows that they're naturally coming to understand the grammatical rules of the language. Now, children start doing this around age two or three, but around age four or five, something interesting starts happening. They actually start making errors in their grammatical rules. So this brings us to what's called overgeneralization. Or you may also see this called over-regularization. And this refers to the idea that the children start applying grammatical rules where they're not supposed to be applied. So the child will say something like, she hitted him, 
or he runned to the store or you know I bringed my bag well what's happening here well again conditioning doesn't really seem to work to explain this because the child is not hearing and being reinforced for these things you know it's not the case that mom and dad are saying hit it and run uh, so the child's not just mimicking or modeling the behavior that they're hearing they're coming up with this on their own and this means that even though they're misapplying the rule it shows that actually they know the rule they've sort of picked up on this idea that if you want to make something into the past tense if you want to say that something already happened well you have this nice little ed rule and that is it you just put ed onto the end of the word and now it means that it already happened or it's in the past tense in some way now again the child hasn't had explicit grammatical instruction on this nobody sat down and said here's how you make the past tense right um, but just by being exposed to the language the child started realizing hey this seems to be how this works and they said oh great now I know how to make the past tense and I can do it every time and they just start doing it with every single word that they want to put into the past, past tense rather than realizing that there are exceptions to this and that you say you know ran rather than run okay so another way that we can see this overgeneralization which actually demonstrates that even though they're making a mistake it shows that they actually know the grammatical rule we see this in what's called the WUG test this was created by Jean Burko Gleason and the WUG test is that you uh, introduce something that the child has not seen before and you introduce a word that the child has not heard before so this eliminates the possibility that, that prior conditioning or prior exposure is influencing what the child is going to say so uh, you know let's I don't know we'll make some creature here I don't know what this is this is a uh, okay this is a wub we'll say okay so I uh, take this here All right and I, I show to the child and I say this is a wub and then I show them a card with two of these and I say here are two and I let the child complete the sentence and what does the child say here are two wugs okay so what does this tell us well this tells us that the child understands the grammatical rule it understands that putting an s onto a word makes it plural if you want to talk about you know if this thing is called a wug then how do I talk about two of them I put an s on the end I have two wugs and then you can do this with other words as well so you can make up some verb and I'll put a link in the video description box where you can see some children doing this where they're given this new word they've never heard before you know like this is this is what it means to pell right you make up some word this is I'm going to pell and then you say what am I doing you know, you're pelling or what did I do before I you know you pelled and this shows that the, the children actually understand all these grammatical rules for how to deal with different tenses even though again they haven't had explicit instruction in this and even though of course sometimes there are exceptions this shows that they know the rule and this WUG test is evidence that even you know at age four or five children understand the rules of grammar in their native language okay now when it comes to the development of these rules of grammar there is a time window and so this brings us to what's called a critical period and the idea here is that children have to have exposure to the language before a certain time so we have this biological predisposition to acquire language but it's not unlimited it has to happen while we're young it has to happen before sometime around age seven is the sort of estimate that we have now how do we have this estimate well it's through some unfortunate cases of children who are not exposed to language children who are deprived of a language environment these are really terrible cases where children are raised in isolation um, and as a result they don't develop linguistic fluency and if they are raised this way after the age of seven or until after the age of seven then their chances of developing full linguistic fluency decrease very sharply so if a, a child is rescued from this type of environment at age five or six then uh, they may be okay and they may be able to still acquire the rules of grammar but if they're not rescued until later age 10 or something then they aren't going to be able to develop this full understanding of grammatical rules and so there's some famous cases of this uh, perhaps the most famous is a girl named Jeannie who was unable to acquire language because she was uh, rescued too late and 
this critical period had already passed. And we'll look at another example of this idea of a critical period in the next video. Um, but the other part of this critical period is that if you're exposed to a language before the age of seven, as, as most people are, this equips you with the ability to process language. And this can then be applied to other languages. So when we talk about a critical period, it's important to remember that we're talking about the first language. You have to have exposure to some language before the age of seven in order for your brain to sort of learn how to process language. But once you've learned one language, you can then apply that to others. And this is further support for this idea of universal grammar. And that if you understand how one language works, you can sort of use that processing to figure out a new language, even though the grammatical rules might be different. So this isn't applying to, this is not saying that you can't learn your second language after age seven, or, or your third, or fourth, or fifth, right? If you've learned a first language, this equips your brain with the ability to process language, and then you can apply that to other languages. Now, it might not be easy, and it might be a bit slower when it comes to acquiring that second, or third, or fourth language, but it is possible. Whereas if you're not exposed to any language before the age of seven, this means that you won't be able to acquire gr grammar in any language. Okay, so that's the idea of a critical period and a little bit about how language develops in children. So uh, we'll look at one more example of this in the next video. I hope you found this helpful. If so, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more. Thanks for watching.